Okay, so we're going to get started now. Good evening and welcome to tonight's Camden Conference Community Event presentation, Will the West Survive with Seth Singleton. I'm Brenda Harrington, Program Librarian at the Belfast Free Library and I want to thank you all for joining us. The Belfast Free Library is happy to continue to host the Camden Conference Community Event Series and glad we can do so virtually. This is the second of three programs that we are hosting in anticipation of this year's Camden Conference, Europe Challenged at Home and Abroad. Our next program will be on January 11th with a presentation by Dick and Marianne Topping on the rise and fall of the Berlin Wall. You can pre-register for the Zoom link at the Belfast Free Library's calendar page. Before I turn this mic over to Judy Stein from the Camden Conference Com Community Events Committee to offer updates about this year's conference and introduce our speaker tonight, I'd like to remind everyone to keep your mics muted and to please put your questions in the chat for the Q&A after the presentation. So now I will turn it over to Judy Stein. Judy. Thank you. And I'm not mute. Am I, Brenda, am I mute? You're good, keep going, okay. I can hear you. All right, sorry, it's the usual Zoom issue. Uh, before, I, I wanna talk for just a minute about ticket, ticketing it for Camden Conference uh, and uh, just mention uh, one other community event, Brenda stole my, my bit, I'll come back. And then I will introduce Seth briefly, Seth will take over. I'm, before we do that, for those of you who've been with us before, we collect the questions in chat and that lets me put them together and shuffle a little bit and make sure and present them to Seth uh, it, so that he is not trying to deal with six things at once, only five. Um, that said, Camden Conference, tickets go on sale tomorrow for members of the conference. Uh, and they will go on sale in mid-January. And that's a slight change from what it says on the, uh, on the, on this page for, um, for all others, for those of anyone here who doesn't know, go on to the Camden Conference page. The conference will be at the Strom Auditorium live. There were requirements uh, for anyone coming in to, to have proof of being fully vaccinated and, and, so, and there will be masks. It will also be available uh, online. So please go to the website check and keep keep watching because anything that happens this year always has the parenthetical comment COVID willing and that's that's where we all are. Um, Brenda mentioned the uh, January 11th event uh, with Dick and, and Marianne Topping and anybody who's been watching Camden Conference <clears throat> events coming out of Belfast, uh, knows Dick. Anybody who's going to senior college in Belfast knows Dick, but we haven't heard from Marianne and a bunch of us are very excited this year that we're going to get the Dick's perspective, but we're also going to get the perspective of Marianne who lived through uh, that period uh, with, with Dick. So that's one. Also on January 6th, uh, and you can find this on the Camden Conference website, the Rockland Library is hosting a, again, a Zoom uh, Camden Conference event, uh, Russia, Europe and the Holocaust by Paige Herlinger. Uh, and so that's as, as I see it, January for Camden Conference. As for tonight's speaker, uh, Seth also is well known to uh, Camden Conference attendees and has been doing community events for, for some time. 
Uh, <clears throat> he is a Russian scholar and he has lived, started schools, taught in, uh, in Tanzania and Ecuador and Russia uh, and Vietnam. And he has consulted uh, again on the teaching of foreign policy um, in China, Mongolia, and Bolivia. So he's got, a, along with the foreign policy, he's been living all over the world. Um, he retired to Maine, he couldn't stand it anymore. So he's also been teaching and uh, teaching at, uh, at UMaine foreign policy, graduate and undergraduate students. And there are several people attending here today who were part of a group. Seth was teaching at the Hutchinson Center and in the back row, you had all these oldies. Uh, those of us who had figured out that whatever he was teaching, it was worth hearing. And we were there and there are a number, I just looked and there are a number of us here today. So with that, I turn, I turn this over to my good friend, Seth, and he will take it from here and introduce his own topic. I'm not gonna touch that. Uh, when he is finished, meanwhile, I'll be watching chat and I'll be putting together uh, the questions and we'll do them that way. So here goes, Seth, it's yours. <laughs> Judy, uh, uh, thank you very much um, for that wonderful introduction. And Brenda, thank you very much for, for hosting the show this evening. Um, Let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to put up my PowerPoint, and we will uh, we will go ahead from uh, go ahead from there. Uh, have we got it? Yep. Okay. Um, the subject this evening. Nothing uh, terribly interesting or important, but I've been thinking about it for a bit. Uh, will the West survive? And um, I think we all understand that uh, th this is kind of an important matter. Uh, since the Second World War, uh, the West with the United States at its core has been the central political organization, economy and ideology in world affairs. The peace and prosperity that much of the world has enjoyed, relative and unequal to be sure, but still the case, is largely a consequence of the Atlantic Alliance between Europe and North America. This has lasted 75 years and be, may be the most successful alliance in world history. We now take the West for granted. We take Europe for granted. It's a nice place to travel to and to send college kids for study abroad. The two key institutions of the West are NATO, a military mutual defense alliance, and the European Union, NATO's twin, designed to end European hostilities and quarrels and bring greater prosperity to all members. Now, while the West has never eliminated national interest, it has confined that interest among its members to peaceful negotiation. The West is a security community within which arms races and war are unthinkable. If that changes, dot, 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 imagine a world without the West, every nation for itself. And that would be a very different and more dangerous world. Finally, the glue of the West is ideology. It's a shared belief in liberal freedoms, capitalism of various sorts, and democratic government. The West is a recent creation. It has existed only since 1945. Before the Second World War, Europe was a nasty stew of nationalist great powers and smaller countries competing for power and killing each other by the millions. Russia, in czarist or Soviet form, was one of those European powers, part and parcel of European realpolitik. Between the two episodes of the great European Civil War of the 20th century, 
which we call World Wars I and II, totalitarian ideologies flourished and drowned out human liberty. The United States was a park on the other side of the pond, rejecting entangling alliances and looking west and south for our expansion. The experience of the First World War didn't help. We were drawn in and in our view saved Europe. Then Woodrow Wilson was snookered at Versailles by sharp elbowed French and British imperialists, dividing the spoils and dumping costs on Germany. Isolationism between the wars was never again and, as your picture shows, America first. Um, and it ran deep. The US public remained adamantly opposed to entering the Second World War until 7 December 1941, two years after it began. And what this shows is Charles Lindbergh, the hero aviator and the <clears throat> uh, main organizer speaker of the America First movement with behind him a picture of George Washington who warned us against entangling alliances. And of course, Donald Trump revived that America First tradition and, uh, and took it to uh, a different, uh, different context. Now the West was born of specific historical circumstances and it's worth uh, thinking what those were because they no longer exist. Industrial production and wealth was concentrated in the United States. After World War II, the United States had maybe 45%, maybe over half of the world's industrial production. And that's now about 15%. We were governed by a Europhile and specifically Anglophile American elite. There was a lot of self-confidence and internationalism. We were ready to lead and remake Europe or the part of Europe we controlled and the Soviets did not. We had no need to exploit or plunder the ruins left by two world wars. And for their part, Europeans, or the two thirds of them that weren't communists or pro-Soviet, welcomed alliance with mighty prosperous productive America for protection against the Soviet Union. And in those days, the relevant world, the relevant political world was this European Atlantic access. It started in, in Moscow and went to Bonn and Paris and London and then across the pond to uh, Washington and New York. And the rest were colonies, except China and Japan, always important to the US and Latin America. And the Americans, unlike the Europeans, have always faced in two directions. The West was created by statesmen in Washington, New York, Boston, London, Paris, and the Western part of Germany. Prison of the Creation is the title of Dean Acheson's memoirs. Acheson was Truman's Secretary of State, succeeding George Marshall. Typical of his time, he was a lawyer, the son of an Anglican bishop born in England, a graduate of Groton, Yale, and Harvard Law. He spoke perfect French. The American leaders of the early Cold War have been lionized and mythologized. They got Europe mostly right, although George Kennan, shown here second from right with President Truman, um, always had, uh, had his doubts. Um, Kennan, by the way, was head of the policy planning staff in Acheson's State Department. Um, Acheson actually wrote the speech that talked about aid to free peoples everywhere, which became the Truman Doctrine. What we ended up with was this, NATO and on the other side, the Warsaw Pact. This is the Cold War map. The numbers actually, by the way, are troop strength as of 1970 or so. And in vocabulary and American thinking, the United States and the European NATO allies became the West or the free world and exemplified by the slogan, which I think had a British origin, Lord Ismay or somebody, the Americans in, the Russians out, and the Germans down. Um, we'll talk quite a bit about the Germans tonight, and uh, I, because I think they are the key to a great many things. NATO represented security against the Soviet Union, now Russia again, but also against quarrels within. 
grounded, it was grounded in the US military presence and commitment, and it is still expanding. The latest member was entered in, 19, in 2017, Montenegro. And of course, it has the famous Article 5 that all members shall take, by the way, such action as they deem necessary, including the use of armed force, but action as they deem necessary to maintain the security of the North Atlantic area. Question then is uh, how far outside the North Atlantic NATO ought to be going, ask people in Afghanistan, Libya, or perhaps some other places. Now, the Americans were just half the story. The West was also created by European statesmen. The last condition for the Atlantic Alliance was visceral fear among Europeans of yet more nationalism and disunity and war. If the First World War had led to the second, what was to prevent the smoking ruins of 1945 Europe from leading to a third? And of course, the fear of yet more war led eventually to the European Union. It started with this European coal and steel community in 1951. The picture shows Conrad Adenauer on the right, looking away from Robert Schumann of France. By the way, he has a German name. He grew up in uh, Alsace-Lorraine. I believe he was born when that was still part of Germany before the war, taken by Germany before the First World War. Um, and they got together and they said, look, we're gonna start this thing. And what they started with was the area between France and Germany that had provoked uh, wars in the past. You marry uh, uh, the steel in Germany and the coal in France, and you put them together in a joint arrangement that's going to be cooperative, not competitive. The EU grew from that. We won't go through all the details. But the point also is that the EU and the <clears throat> NATO at the core of the West are historical twins, and they were in fact designed that way. Here, totally burying the hatchet, de Gaulle and Adenauer signing the Elysee Treaty of 1963, the EU was always a Franco-German project, still basically is, although it's gotten much more complicated as it has grown to, I believe now 28 members, and the EU always contained the idea of European independence from the United States. I use the word contained in two different senses. That idea of independence is contained within the Western alliance in the sense of, of not getting out, but it also is contained in the sense of a seed that can be, that can sprout under appropriate conditions. Now, the Western Alliance has three essential parts. Security, we've mentioned with NATO. Mutual prosperity through trade and open borders, certainly within the community. We now have Schengen in Europe where there aren't any personal, any borders to personal travel at all. That should come back after COVID. Uh, and liberal democratic ideology. And um, I think, you know, it's a bit like a stool. Any successful alliance needs these three legs. Uh, the first two are important and talked about often. I think the third ideology is no less important and it is the leg under strain right now. My old teacher, Carl Deutsch taught me about a security community, a group of nations among whom war is unthinkable. It's mostly a state of mind, more than a balance of power consider the United States and Canada, but it can be glued together by treaties and diplomatic coordination and above all by shared ideology. If you add to NATO, the US security treaties with Japan and South Korea, and then perhaps include others, um, you see this huge security community stretching from now Lithuania and Poland on one end to South Korea and Japan on the other. Put differently, the democratic peace, the idea that dem democracies don't fight each other, may be more 20th century ideology and circumstance than an iron law of history, but it has worked. The Atlantic Alliance was created to fend off the Soviet Union, including an agreement among all parties 
the communist parties in Western Europe would not be allowed to win elections or take power. Election management was one of uh, its earlier practices. But it's also true that this Atlantic community has tremendous security value in and of itself. As I mentioned, it settles disputes by negotiation. Greece and Turkey, for example, or in the US Pacific alliances, South Korea and Japan. It's interesting, Turkey has been rejected by the European Union and has now left NATO in all but name. And Greek Turkish hostility is heating up again over gas deposits in the Eastern Mediterranean with France and Israel on the side of the Greeks. The second pillar was economic. And during the Cold War, the economic pillar may actually have been the more important. We think of a containment as military policy, but as George Kennan understood from the beginning and wrote in his long telegram and famous Mr. X article, that was simply deterrence to gain time. The East-West struggle would be decided by which side had the more effective economic system and made the better contribution to the welfare of its citizens. In 1945, no one knew how that was going to play out. By 1960, Western Europe was prosperous and on the road to unity. Workers were buying cars and houses and the Berlin Wall went up, come back in January uh, for that, to keep Aussies, East Germans, out of the prosperous and liberal West. Marxists had expected history to be the other way around. As an aside, I would argue that the same is true today in US-China relations. U.S.-China competition will be decided by technology and prosperity and attractiveness of society, not by guns or coercive sanctions. Second, it turned out that mutual prosperity an economic, not political value, became variable, became the condition, the sine qua non, for European political solidarity and eventually the confederation, which we call the European Union. And this graph shows the economic gains in standard of living per capita income for the bottom 90% of the population since 1950. Why is it important to note the bottom 90%? Well, because you can have a lot of economic gain all going to the top, as has happened recently in the United States and uh, uh, elsewhere in the world. This is the bottom 90%. And what it shows is that there were very large gains in Germany, France, Italy, also in Canada, uh, in Japan, less in the United States, but the United States started from a much higher level. This sets all of the initial <clears throat> uh, countries at uh, initially at, 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 at the same level at 100. So in fact, it really did encourage and create a great deal of prosperity. Now, the third pillar, the shared ideology, is, I would argue, in deep trouble. Here's the wall coming down, freedom scrawled on it, people uh, sitting on top of it, being watched by the uh, east side uh, police, and of course, they began to take their hammers to it, and the Cold War uh, literally uh, fell apart uh, very shortly. So, freedom, fine. But what is this ideology we're talking about? Ideology is a big word. And by the way, I, I, I know this is an arguable definition. It's fuzzy around the edges, but I think probably it'll hold up. Uh, you can call it liberal internationalism if you want to. But that ideology is essential within the West, but also potentially spread to the rest of the world individual freedoms or protection of human rights. Remember that uh, the human rights, the original phrase was les droits de l'homme, French from the French Revolution, contemporary with the US Declaration of Independence. Every country a democracy, accountable to its citizens, not the same thing as the liberal part of freedoms and rights protection, peace by deterring aggression and civil war, peace through strength. I believe that was an Eisenhower slogan, but also arms control to diminish the possibility of war even outside the area. Borders, certainly inside 
the West, but potentially worldwide, open to travelers and to information and ideas. Migration is another matter. World organizations, NGOs, the UN, expanding their activity, free trade, leveling up poor countries through technology transfer and financial aid. Now, how much of this actually remains today as an ideological uh, uh, <clears throat> unity of the Western alliance? Until Trump, every president since World War II considered the US-European alliance, the West, essential to US security. By the way, there are four presidents missing. I just didn't want to clutter up the page too much. Um, you can figure out who they are. But you can argue that there were internal policy differences among all of these folks. Some of them did a better job than others. You can agree with some and disagree with others. But the one thing they didn't disagree about was this matter of the West, the free world, uh, and how important it was to the United States. Some things started to happen after the end of the Cold War. The Russian world, as Putin would call it, shrank from the center of Europe to the boundaries of Russia that were essentially the same as existed under at the beginning of the reign of Peter the Great. Uh, Putin pushed back hard starting at the Munich Security Conference in 2007 and still does. And we may end this discussion with, uh, with some discussion of the present crisis in Ukraine. At the same time, NATO expanded was pushed to Russia's borders, including former Soviet republics. Um, this shows the expansion, 1999, Poland, Czechoslovakia, as it was then, Hungary, 2004, the Baltic countries, which had been part of the Soviet Union itself, Romania and Bulgaria, and then in 2008, an application to join from Ukraine and Georgia, which would have, uh, as we'll note with a map later, put the NATO literally on the Soviet or on the Russian border, really from St. Petersburg all the way to the Caspian Sea. Um, in 1990, by the way, the United States had informally promised to Gorbachev that NATO would not expand beyond reunited Germany. It's a lot of controversy of uh, how, what sort of promise that was, whether it should have been believed, but apparently there was a verbal commitment made. Now, right along with NATO expanded the European Union, the twins. Uh, the Americans wanted Eastern Europe. Remember Donald Rumsfeld's New Europe, uh, which was pro-American rather than the bulky folks in Germany and France who had opposed the Iraq invasion. Um, US wanted Eastern Europe inside the EU and the Eastern Europeans wanted inside the EU the EU and the British wanted them inside the EU and probably the Germans also. And so it expanded. And you can do the uh, map and you will find that there are a couple of members of NATO, um, Iceland, Norway, Turkey, that are not members, Ireland, Iceland, Norway, and Turkey are not members of the EU and a couple of members of the EU, Sweden, Finland, and Ireland that are not members of NATO but basically they are the same in their group of countries. Now, the other thing that happened not long ago was the economic challenge. We had the 2008 financial crisis and the Eurozone crisis. And we had all the effects that we all understand. We had impoverishment of workers. We had inequality in the globalized globalization rich of the 0.1% or the 0.01%. We have reaction against immigrants seen as taking jobs and keeping wages low. And the people turned against immigrants and elites. And you got Brexit, Trump, gilets jaunes, the French yellow vests, anti-vaxxers now in the United States, you get militia. And as Tom explained, uh, Germany basically sailed through the crisis and so did China. Now, there was the Eurozone crisis, which you didn't pay enough attention to. It almost broke the EU. Um, I love these cartoons. They're called Poland balls for some reason. Maybe the Pol a Polish cartoonist invented them, showing uh, 
<clears throat> among other things, here's Germany uh, giving a little bit of money to Greece. And the Greece, Greeks slurp it up, come back for more, and the Germans glower and they shrink Greece down. Or a Greek cartoon on the other side with EU as a witch. Uh, Europa, Europa as a witch, crashing the Greeks into the ground, breaking them with Spain, Italy, and Portugal next up. Now, it turned out that uh, the Germans finally realized that historical prosperity could not continue, European prosperity, without, could not continue indefinitely by extraction from the European South. And Angela Merkel deserves the credit. So does Christine Lagarde at the IMF and particularly Mario Draghi, then president of the European Central Bank and now prime minister of Italy. Another thing that happened, China rose and rose and rose. We will talk about China in a bit. And you had the migrant surge. Europe closed its borders eventually, although Germany took a million migrants or so uh, in the interim who were actually relative, have been well assimilated economically, and I believe culturally as well. Tom Remington also spoke about that. But the migrant surge had a tremendous effect on Europe, and the question, Europe almost broke over that, but decided eventually that it would indeed close its borders. Most recently, the surge of orchestrated by Lukashenko in Belarus, flying people from Iraq and elsewhere to the Belarus, to the Polish border was contained and the EU did not object. Now, the break point from all of this came in 2016 with Brexit and the election of Donald Trump. Here's the famous Brexit poster. Breaking point, the EU has failed us all. And the British took their vote on Brexit in favor of exiting the European Union in, I believe, June of 2016. And then six months later, you had this. You had Donald Trump's election, unexpected, at least certainly not expected in Europe, um, claiming that I alone can fix it, taking America in its populist direction. And I wonder whether you want to think of it this way. Was the West canceled? in 2016. Um, maybe, maybe not. Now, Trump, of course, is one of a species. He is uh, a wide, one of a widespread species, authoritarian, nationalist, conservative. And these folks are determined to upend liberal democratic governance. The West was, of course, faced with a serious challenge to its ideology one that finds roots and money and organization both within the West and outside. And I'm sure most of you can uh, identify all of these folks. I would note, by the way, it's not just a Western uh, list of uh, uh, people, or it's also Asian. We have Duterte and Modi. It's Middle Eastern. We have Al-Sisi and uh, Mohammed uh, uh, bin Salman. Uh, we have Jair Bolsonaro from Brazil and Netanyahu from Israel and Erdogan of Turkey. And I could add actually quite a few more. It was also interesting who they demonized. Uh, Angela Merkel, Hillary Clinton, and George Soros, uh, who provided tremendous amounts of money to help uh, the transition from Soviet-linked communist states to more liberal ones. Soros is, of course, Hungarian by origin a very, very rich financier who got his money apparently trading currencies and a Hungarian Jew by birth. I once worked for his outfit in Mongolia. Now, what I wanna stress is that this, these folks, including Trump, are presenting an ideological challenge to the entire idea of liberal democratic and internationalist thinking. It's a very old ideology, perhaps the oldest. Freedom is redefined as being a member of your national community. Individualism, multiculturalism, and globalization are baloney. 
religion, tradition, holds the community together. It's male dominated, it's heterosexual, it exalts the nuclear family. It assumes that values, practices, traditions, and religion are national, not universal. And the state must defend natural, national culture against outsiders, starting of course with immigrants from away. Liberals are enemies, so is the lying press, the Lugan press of the free critical media. The law should uphold state authorities, the nation, people, and God. And the nation and the people deserve their leader, find him and follow him. We had the spectacle of the Trump-Putin bromance. You can have a lot of, uh, a lot of fun with this. Uh, this is a Moscow billboard just after Trump's election. We're going to make the world great again together. Um, there's a kind of a role model for, for Trump, I think. We don't really know the details of uh, all that happened uh, between the two or what was going on in Trump's head. Maybe the historians will uh, unravel some of it, but the basic <clears throat> attraction is pretty clear. This is my favorite. This is the Russian army store across from the US embassy. They had a 10% off sale in honor of Trump's inauguration. Uh, it's hardly socialist. At the top it says Armia Rossi, the Russian army. 20th January, uh, Trump's inauguration, and way down in the right-hand corner to the workers of the embassy, it's right across the street, and to the citizens of the United States. Um, here's a Russian journalist holding up a poster of Putin, Trump, and Marine Le Pen, who didn't quite make it in the French election. Macron was elected instead about three months later, I guess it was in April, 2017. And it's a very good thing she didn't because she was determined to leave NATO and the European Union. Um, note, by the way, they all look alike. They all have square jaws, they're blonde. And uh, so is the journalist. And then finally, neighborly, neighboring of Russia take on the whole thing. This is the bromance and the whole, and that's a big send up of Putin who of course has anti-gay laws and uh, uh, claims that, uh, that LGBTQ is uh, part of a decadent Western conspiracy to undermine countries with good traditional values. Russians approved of Trump much more than of Obama, uh, the opposite of the European reaction. Helsinki, July 2018. Trump absolves Putin of meddling in the US election just a few days after the United States government had released the indictment of GRU, that's Russian military intelligence officers by name for messing around with Facebook and other forms of election interference. We still don't know what's going on here. I still don't. And of course, we have the mass expression of this. Here's the Charlottesville Unite the Right March in August 2017. And here's the 60,000 white nationalists marching on Polish Independence Day a couple of months later. And I like this one. I'd rather be a Russian than a Democrat. And I think the question is whether the United States would follow that path if Trump would be reelected or if he's going to be reelected in 2024. And in fact, Europeans, I think, increasingly think this is going to happen, and so do many Americans. Now, this is actually my favorite picture. Here is uh, uh, Angela Merkel um, staring down Trump at a G7 meeting, and it gives you a clear sense of where the alliance was going. And in fact, I think that the German-American relationship is the core of that alliance. And the question of Germany in relation to the United States is going to probably determine its future. Germany had tremendous uh, appreciation for Obama and no appreciation whatsoever, that's the blue line, for Donald Trump. 
typically these uh, uh, <clears throat> swings of mood are greater for the view of the leader than they are for the view of the country, but they work in parallel. The German weekly Der Spiegel raised a lot of um, controversy with its poster after Trump's election, with Trump cutting off the head of Lady Liberty and a knife with blood. And then, of course, they ran one after Biden's election, with Biden putting the head back on and wearing a COVID mask. And I would ask those who know Germany a lot better than I do, but I think there's a German gut level fear that if authoritarian rule one in the United States, and they're very sensitive to what that could look like, could win again in their own country. Now, Biden is back, but America isn't. That's a wonderful quote. Comes from Swedish Prime Minister Carl Bildt, former Swedish Prime Minister, who's now a commentator in Europe. After Biden was elected, European countries shifted very quickly, and others as well, to a very favorable view of Biden as opposed to a very unfavorable view of Trump. But since then, there's been a kind of setting in of reality. The Trumpists may return to power. Biden hasn't changed Trump policies. There's a general fear of American unilateralism and aggressiveness that is held over from many past events, expresses itself in worried about American attacks on Iran, among other things. We muffed Afghanistan, which was, by the way, a NATO operation. There are the COVID travel, travel restrictions, which are irritants, and the Europeans weren't, haven't been consulted very much or listened to. But I think there's something deeper going on here. I think there's a foreign policy consensus in the United States. And it predated Trump, particularly in our reaction to forever wars and watching the Chinese and watching the economic decline in places like, uh, you know, Middletown, Ohio. Um, and it's continued after Trump. Nobody ever said anything about foreign policy in the 2020 election. Why not? Because, in fact, there was this consensus and nobody was going to rock the boat and oppose it because it was going to cost them votes. And I think what it looks like is something like this. And by the way, you can compare this to the previous uh, uh, slide talking about liberal internationalist ideology as the glue that holds the West together. We're going to block the Chinese. We're going to protect American workers. We're going to end the wars in the Middle East. Yeah, we still like NATO, but the Europeans should do more. Climate change is real. I think, by the way, there's a consensus on that now. The views on climate change look like a normal curve, not a bipolar division. But the others are going to lead on that. We're not going to do as much as some people. And we're a little skeptical about uh, the gas prices when we think about it. Human rights and nation buildings, ending civil wars in faraway places, think Ethiopia, think Myanmar, is, think Nigeria. It's, it's kind of a fool's errand. We don't want to do that anymore. We have our enemies other than China, but we just kind of hope they stay quiet and above all, concentrate on our internal problems, which are indeed serious. And I think this leaves little room for forward policy in Europe and it dismisses liberal internationalist ideology. Now, I mentioned the US and Germany. I think it's the core. I think if the US and Germany part way as the West is over. And there's some difficulties. German cooperation with China. I'll mention that more in a second. Nord Stream, the German-Russian gas pipeline. Republicans in Congress uh, are making big noise about how U.S. should impose sanctions on German companies, as well as Russian or other ones involved with Nord Stream. Nord Stream, Biden said, well, it can go ahead. I think he was trying to um, uh, agree with the Germans on that. It also will provide a lot of gas to Germany, and it's a cold winter. The Europeans are going to need it. Um, but uh, the Germans have held it up with bureaucratic approvals, and that has left recently elected Prime Minister Olaf Scholz in the hot seat. Um, 
the fear about the Nord Stream pipeline is that it makes the gas pipelines through Ukraine redundant, unnecessary. And the Russians can shut off the gas to Europe through Ukraine whenever they please and still ship gas through Germany. Then there's the matter of the defense spending by NATO members, the share of GDP. Uh, the Germans are low on this. The French and the British do better. Um, the famous 2% pledge came with the Obama administration. The United States uh, uh, has pushed more spending, but Germany, among more than others, have not responded. And of course, you have the dust up with the French. Um, the French were going to sell 60 nuclear submarines to Australia. The Australians backed out at American and British urging and bought US built nuclear attack submarines instead. The French got mad. Um, the French also have a reaction to what they call woke culture. They don't like the idea of the racial and identity clashes in the United States. They think they have no place in France. They want to keep this culture of woke identity out of France. And this is not just a right-wing position. This is a general French one. Um, the Americans are committing suicide. They retreated from the Taliban and they are reeling from the uh, dictatorship of woke is the empire sinking. Well, we've had a whole series of French right American stubs. None of them are yet fatal. Um, the French developed their nuclear deterrent. We didn't, we opposed their colonial wars. They pulled out of the military command. They denounced the Iraq invasion. Now we have the Australian deal. And in fact, uh, um, I think uh, probably um, the French American relationship uh, has already bounced back, will bounce back from this one. But I'm reminded, and I go back to that earlier notion of the uh, uh, Franco German entente at the core of the Atlantic Alliance, of the European Union. Uh, de Gaulle, even during the Second World War, fumed about les Anglo Saxons who were scheming behind the back of the French. Now, there is a temptation for Germany and for Europe, uh, uh, Europe in general. And it looks something like this. It's a very different grand strategy for Europe. And it would in fact toss the Americans back to where they came from because they're not following the ideology of the West. An economic bloc with China, including an internet agreement and a climate change agreement, make a deal with Russia over Eastern Europe. And there's a very old history of that. You start with the 1795 partition of Poland. You could end, well, it was a German initiative, but it was German approved. The Henry Kissinger's deal with the Soviet Union in 1975. And you can put dates like uh, 1918, the Brest-Litovsk agreement, and obviously the 1939 uh, Hitler-Stalin pact uh, in the middle, which explains by the way, why the Eastern Europeans really want an American connection, uh, most of all, because they don't really trust a European and German one. Now you could strengthen the EU with that German-French axis, and you've changed the motto. Chinese in, the Russians quiet, the EU up, and the Americans mostly out. That temptation is there. It's not presently on the table. Schultz is a centrist, says kind things about the Atlantic Alliance. Macron isn't quite ready to quit, but it could be, and nothing in it is historically new. Now I want to end by talking a little bit about the external push that may be either uniting or breaking apart the Western alliance. First, of course, is China. Um, although Russia and Ukraine, which I'll end with, are more imminent. Will Europe favor China? Well, China and Europe are now each other's major trading power, replacing the United States for China and the United States for Europe. Chinese planned their Silk Road project over land through Eurasia and by sea uh, through the Red Sea and the Med Mediterranean. It's not really a strategic plan. It's just lots and lots of projects. But the idea 
is that all of this has Europe as its destination. Eurasia is what's in between. And the Chinese have bought stakes in European ports uh, to go along with this. I'm, I'm fascinated, by the way, with the fact that this map essentially maps on the um, route of Marco Polo's travels from Venice to uh, uh, the court of Kublai Khan in China uh, of the 13th century, both the land part and the sea part. And the Chinese mentioned this. They say this is an old, old, old connection. But the idea is obviously to reach Europe with an economic deal and lots of infrastructure in between and leave the Americans over on the other side of the pond where they belong. It's just the largest port in the world, except the land port, Xinjiang, Kazakhstan border, the containers go to Europe. The EU has a negative balance of trade with China, but it's only about one third of the American negative balance. Germany has a positive balance. China is Germany's largest trading partner. Um, it's essential, China's essential to the German auto industry. I might add, by the way, also to General Motors and Tesla. But Volkswagen is now selling almost half of its cars worldwide in China. And China is also essential to the Italian and French luxury goods industry. Chinese have bought up a few European companies. The agreement to buy up more easily is now stuck because the European Parliament has uh, decided that they don't really want to go that route, at least not yet. Um, some important companies, Volvo, Pirelli Tires, the Swiss agrochemicals giant Syngenta, German robotics company and the port of Piraeus in Greece. Be a lot more. Then there's this interesting notion of the Eastern Central European arrangement with China, which is several years old, I think 2015, 14, something like that. China was going to make a special deal of building infrastructure there, part of the Belt and Road. Um, it's basically flopped. Uh, the Lithuanians uh, allowed Taiwan to set up an office this year, and the Chinese uh, uh, reacted with, uh, <clears throat> with sanctions. Um, other places have not been quite so uh, unfavorable to China. There's really nothing much that has happened by it. This was a recent New York Times piece on Montenegro's road to nowhere. Billion dollar cost. Debt service, a third of Montenegro's annual budget, if that's correct, seems extravagant, but that's what's said. And the road is in the middle of a, a possible road from Serbia to the coast, but that's all that's been built. Europeans have also been very conscious of the repression of Uyghurs and other issues involving China. And the research on the Uyghurs has been led by uh, uh, a German, Adrian Zint. Um, and he, of course, has been <clears throat> attacked by China and uh, in various ways, as have others who do this. He translated the documents. And in 1919 and 2019 and 20, the Europeans turned against China for all of the reasons mentioned here, including coal burning power plants, wolf warrior diplomacy, efforts within German and European universities to stop criticism of China, as well as the Uyghurs in Hong Kong. And just, you know, it's like a, 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 a tipping point. Views of China became extremely unfavorable. That's the blue lines pretty much across the board. So I'm not really worried about the great, uh, uh, great Chinese European condominium uh, while those attitudes prevail. Finally, a couple of words on Ukraine and then we'll go to questions. Ukraine, as you know, is now uh, a hot button again. There are Russian troops who have been massing close to the border and stockpiling equipment. It's not clear what's going to go on. The Russian media have been pushing the idea that uh, uh, Ukraine uh, needs to have a change. And uh, we have a crisis in the making and, in fact, on the front burner. Um, Ukraine, as you know, was part of the Russian state for centuries. This is the statue of Bogdan Khmelnytsky in Kiev in front of the Santa Sophia church. We note that 
again, if Ukraine joined NATO as they would like to do, and as they asked to do in 2008, along with Georgia, uh, NATO would be on the Russian border, in the case of Poland, only the Belarus border, all the way from here, St. Petersburg, around to the Caspian, if Georgia also joined. And the Black Sea would become much more a NATO uh, <clears throat> uh, province than it is now. It's now pretty much a Russian lake. Um, as a realist world, he believes that great powers have spheres of influence, that the Americans have encroached on his turf, and that great powers can make deals about who rules where and territory can change hands. All the tools of policy are normal. There's no morality, it includes subversion, threats, limited war. And nations are based on tradition, religion, and culture, that conservative ideology. Universal human rights are a world of law, are silly ideas. Liberalism is declining. The United States and the West are in decline. Now, one can argue about the nuances, but that's basically where he's coming from. Looks at Ukraine. This is, he sees that most of the people in what used to be called Novorossiya when the Russians first conquered it in the eight, late 18th century uh, are Russian speaking. The folks who speak more, more Ukrainian, languages are close, but they're not the same, are in the West and center, North. And he believes that in fact, all of Ukraine, but certainly that part, which is mostly Russian speaking and traditionally uh, uh, <clears throat> was originally part of Russia. Ukraine is present borders were created only in for the Soviet Union in the 1920s, probably should come back home. And he wrote an interesting piece in July this year called On the Historical Unity of Russians and Ukrainians. They're all one people, in three parts, Ukrainians, great Russians, Ukrainian, Russians, great Russians, Ukrainians, little Russians, Mala Russia, and Belarusians, white Russians. They're artificially split. Ukraine really isn't a nation. And this is a quote from that document. True sovereignty of Ukraine is possible only in partnership with Russia. He also believes that the Ukrainian government is a creature of the US and survives only because of US weapons. And he kind of leaves out blaming the Europeans, although they provide most of the economic help. Ukraine must never ever join NATO or the EU. We know where this came from. This is the rebellion, revolution, coup, uprising in Ukraine in February 2014 with Ukrainians protesting the decision of their elected president, Yanukovych, to join a Russian economic community and reject the on the table about to be signed association with the European Union. Our Assistant Secretary of State Europe, Victoria Nuland, who was again in the Biden administration in the same job, was out on the streets of Kiev giving out goodies and uh, making phone calls in which she discussed who should be the leaders of a new Ukrainian government. These were published after I'm sure they were intercepted by Russian intelligence. The Russians sent their little green men to Crimea on the next day, which violated European rule number one, no forced changes of borders. The Russians cite Kosovo as a precedent. They held a referendum in Ukraine in which they defined the choice as fascism or Russia, the Nazis or Russia. And of course, the referendum approved Russia. Most people in Crimea actually think of themselves as Russians, not as Ukrainians. And the Russians cited the uh, uh, far right ultranationalists here carrying a portrait of Stepan Bandera, who was the pro Nazi Ukrainian nationalist leader of the Second World War. He was involved in killing Poles and Jews. Um, but these are a small minority, although a quite noisy one. But in fact, since these people are out there, this is the choice. They allowed rebels to seize the region of the east, Luhansk and Donetsk, which by the way, was where both Brezhnev and Khrushchev made their careers. Both were born in or near it, uh, which still remain under control of a, a group which is basically uh, 
uh, staffed by, funded by, and armed by Russia. The negotiation that prevented a wider war was, was held with Merkel, Poroshenko, and Putin. Note the German Russian, but this time including the Ukrainian leader. In fact, it was done the way life should be if you're in the Western Alliance. Obama and Merkel consulted extensively throughout the whole thing. Germany led the talks, but with constant and prior US agreement, and then both sides applied sanctions. That's the basic background. Russia then went off and had very large military parades and uh, made a big point of nationalism, which was well received then in Russia. Krumnosh, Crimea is ours. And that set the stage for where things are now. This is Putin's view and Russia's view of Ukraine. Uh, Poroshenko was replaced by Zelensky in 2019. He, Poroshenko was an oligarch, did little to change corruption. Zelensky has tried to do a bit, but has not yet been that successful. But here we are polishing the toes of the American shoe boot. Ukrainians have a different view. They want Europe, they have for years. Their government has applied formally, or it says it wants to apply to join NATO. This has not yet been brought to the point of a candidate membership. Their opinion has been moving steadily westward. And in fact, that's in real contrast to where Putin says Ukraine has to be. So we get to the current crisis. We have vision forces, possible invasion. This is what the intelligence community says and a lot of other people. They did this also this past April and then withdrew. Here's Zelensky out in the snow talking to Ukrainian soldiers, trying to keep their morale up. On uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov, December 3rd, the nightmare scenario of military confrontation is returning. And Russian media have again started showing maps of what they call Nova Russia the entire Southern part of Ukraine. And they can in fact do all kinds of things to make trouble there short of a full scale invasion and may in fact do so. Most recently, the West meeting as the G7, Liverpool has threatened severe economic sanctions, which is short of sending US troops, but more than making a deal or committing that Ukraine will never be able to enjoy uh, NATO. Just calling it a bluff. And I would note that in the in Russia, war with Ukraine has little public support. Then you have the Baltic, which are in some people's next on the list, but they're members of NATO and the EU. So I think Russia will leave them alone. The number of Russian speakers in these countries has declined it's fewer than it was. Now, let's do our predictions. Yogi said, it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. And my predictions would go something like this. If Trump wins in 2024, we're pretty much done. Uh, the Europeans will regard that as the Americans taking their leave and the United States will be ruled once again by a man who was reportedly ready to leave NATO in his second term and may do so in his second term if it comes later. Uh, if the Republicans win, there'll be more tensions. They'll become acute over climate change, China, and the European resistance to export of the God versus woke culture wars. Um, the European unity and cohesion, I think, is going to increase. Tensions will be contained. The EU has overcome their crises and the authoritarians maybe are losing, maybe are barely holding their own, but I don't seem to be winning more support. Eventually, Russia will mellow, but not very soon. And they will eventually balance between China and Europe. The China scare will level off. Europe will not join US containment of China, but the US and Europe will drift further apart. This is history, not 
policy. And let's be clear, the drift is on the American side. It may be natural and inevitable, times change, no alliance lasts forever. And the drift is back to a world before the West where the US is a European cousin, but not a sibling. The relationship that existed from George Washington until 1941. Um, let me just end there and go for questions. I'm sorry I've gone on so long. Okay. Um, I'm people. If if you would write your questions in the chat, and we can kind of look at them and lump them and see what we can do. Uh, Seth, living as we are right now in a world of COVID um, and given its spread in Europe and given the, the the view that the Chinese caused it, the Russians have a vaccine, nobody seems to know what works. What influence do you think that, that COVID may have had or may have going forward on the West? Yeah, thank you, Judy. I've, I've been trying to think about that for some time. Um, this may seem a wrong conclusion to some of you, but I don't think COVID has very much effect at all. And let me explain why. I think what COVID has done is make almost all countries turn inward. They're worried about their own situation. They have less bandwidth for foreign affairs and big time politics. And they're all struggling. Um, put a little differently, I think what COVID has done uh, is, is, is make the legitimacy of almost every government, and I think that includes Russia, um, China, we don't really know, uh, the legitimacy of all governments is declining. And in the long run, that means that all connections between countries may be harder to hold together. That would be true within Europe and be true between the United States and Europe. But I also think that that effect is going to snap back uh, as we become more normal after COVID. And I haven't seen anything that really changed in the sort of structural construct of world affairs due to COVID. I think it, it is uh, concentrated governments on their internal problems, but not much else. Well, we have, we've got a, a question from uh, David Soares, and please forgive me if my pronunciation is not correct. Uh, it looks like we're rather without a rudder, drifting off into uncharted waters with no captains and no navigation. Is that the way you see this? Yes. Simple answer. I think that's probably correct. Uh, I think the Chinese would like to uh, substitute a Chinese uh, ship from Zhong Hall's treasure fleet of the 15th century for the Western version of the ship. But I don't think that's going to happen. And I don't see any other place in the world that really is going to emerge either as a country or frankly, as an individual, as a world leader, which means that all kinds of things are now up for grabs, uncertainty rules. I think that's absolutely right. From Cindy Reed, uh, do we have to solve our own problems before there can be progress on within the United States on external on issues on foreign policy? Yes. <laughs> that's another easy answer. I think that's absolutely true. And I, I'd go back to that list of sort of consensus policies I, I put up. And I think they really are a consensus. And I think that uh, the idea that we have to concentrate, just like everybody else, on our own problems first and try to get those under control before we go blundering around the world is probably the bedrock 
consensus in the United States. And that's a consensus no matter what side of the political fence you're on. Now, depending on your side of the political fence, the way you'd solve our problems may be totally different and opposed. But the fact that we need to concentrate on those problems is not a dispute. Um, the United States, I think the public is willing to confront China, but the last time I saw a poll, a majority were opposed to defending Taiwan by force. And I don't think there'd be all that many people now who uh, really would want war with Russia because the Ukrainians don't wanna be bullied by Vladimir Putin, which is where that situation now is. I think the foreign policy elite, the think tankers and the people in government now, which by the way, include uh, people who used to be neoconservatives as well as those who used to be liberals, um, would not agree with this. They want a much more active foreign policy, but they are not the country and Biden, and I think any president would not be able to simply override where the people are coming from in taking a much more active role. Is this the result, do you think, of our years of seeing ourselves as going out and saving the world? Yes. And obviously in Iraq, in Afghanistan, um, in Haiti, and in a bunch of other places, it didn't work. Um, the world didn't get saved. We lost people and we spent money. And the only effect it seemed to have was to increase the chaos. Uh, the whole Iraq misadventure had two clear losers, the United States and uh, the Islamists, Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State, also Saddam Hussein, and it had a couple of clear winners, Iran, China, and Russia. That's not what you want. Do you see a link um, with Iran, China, and Russia? Yes. Um, it's not clear how far it's going to go or what's going to happen. Uh, Iran was recently admitted as a full member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is a Chinese project and a Chinese-Russian project. Includes Central Asia. It also includes India and Pakistan, um, and uh, you know other countries. Maybe Turkey are kind of waiting on the doorstep. And the idea there is to create a kind of security community, which would exclude Islamists and anybody who wanted to uh, uh, interfere with internal affairs and prop up dictators in power in that whole region. Iran has just been admitted as a full member. Iran also has a, on paper, uh, something like $400 billion loan coming from uh, China in the next few years. China buys most of the oil that Iran manages to export um, and is uh, the lifeline to Iran while the sanctions remain. So yeah, Iran is throwing in its lot in that direction, particularly under its new government of Raisi, uh, a hardliner, very close to the Iranian Revolutionary Guards. Iran will have an Eastern future and all that. I don't think the Iranian public is in quite the same place at all. But what's happened most recently is that for a while, there was Europeans were very angry at the United States, Trump, for abandoning the 2015 nuclear agreement uh, negotiated by Obama with the Iranians. I Iran in most recent times, the last couple of months, has said that, uh, well, we'll go back to it, but only if all the sanctions are lifted first and we aren't going to necessarily roll back our nuclear program to where it used to be, we're gonna have to talk more about that. And uh, the Europeans have gotten closer to the United States as that dynamic has played out. But they certainly don't want a war and they are kind of counting on the United States to restrain Israel from starting one. Actually, the Israelis and the Iranians are in a lot of a war at the moment. Um, so we will see how that plays out. It is a wild card, it is uncertain. Um, the Iranians, uh, 
are going to keep their sending their missiles out and they're going to keep their support of militias in Iraq, Lebanon and Syria, Hezbollah, and also their aid to the Houthis in, in, in Yemen. And they say they will never ever negotiate uh, any kind of rollback in those policies. The Europeans are not happy with that either. I've got some questions. I want to go back to <laughs> um, from uh, from David uh, to Cousins. If if we had had a Hillary presidency, would we be in the same place today we're in? No, and the reason is that uh, a Hillary presidency would have contrived to uh, continue a whole lot of policies that had existed before her election. And there would have been even increasing tension in the United States between her administration and where a lot of people were coming from. And that would have been particularly the case if she tried to maintain this activist foreign policy. And she knew that. Uh, she, in fact, was ready to abandon the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which would have created a kind of uh, trade union very much excluding China. Um, and she said she was going to uh, abandon that. Trump abandoned it on the first day in office. But no, I'm, I'm not sure how it would have played out, but I think it would have been, uh, would have been quite different. So from, from um, Jane Nice, do you predict that, that uh, Germany will not join sanctions against Russia uh, if they move into the Ukraine? No, Germany will. And that's uh, the announcement from the G7. G7 is interesting. It, it's members along with the United States, used to include Russia, the Russians got booted out, are Germany, France, Britain, Japan, Italy, and Canada. That's the other six. And so when the G7 made its declaration that there would be very severe, connect, very severe retaliation, although not military retaliation against Russia, if it in fact invaded Ukraine, the Germans were very much on board with that. And I think they will go along with it. Um, they have the temptation of a deal with Russia, but even more than that, they fear all kinds of destabilization. If you actually got a Russian invasion of Ukraine and Ukrainian resistance to it, which you will if there's any encouragement from the United States in particular, um, all the bets are off for what happens in the, in the whole region. And I think the Germans fear that more than anything else. They have a lot of investment, a lot of stake in Eastern European countries, as well as uh, uh, you know, in China and also in, uh, in Russia. So no, I think the Germans at the moment are very much on board. What we don't know is what the Russians are gonna do and what if, the reaction would be. And it's not just a matter of invasion or no invasion. Uh, the Russians can nibble. They can send a small force to Odessa, which is the other major city in Ukraine, which is Russian speaking and uh, more sympathetic to Russia than people in Kiev or the north and western parts of Ukraine. They can send, a, send little green men to Mariupol, another port. They could try to sort of uh, work through uh, uh, not a full-scale invasion, but various versions of just destabilization. And they can keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it, which is what I see as the real problem. But no, the Germans will be on board at this point. And, and if it drags on and the, and the Russians keep doing it and keep doing it, what are we looking at? <laughs> Who knows? I don't. Um, I think probably at some point we're looking at much more serious violence with, again, totally unpredictable consequences. I think if the United States said, well, we're going to try to either send troops to Ukraine or welcome the Ukraine's application to NATO, Putin would then start doing something clearly uh, um, violent or subversive to really make a difference in Ukraine. The question is, if the United States doesn't do that and Putin backs off again and then comes back, 
uh, will at some point the Ukrainians get tired of the whole show and say, okay, big deal, we'll become Cold War Finland all over again. We'll let the Russians run our foreign policy just so long as they, uh, as they don't uh, stop our trade with Western Europe. That, by the way, was the solution that Henry Kissinger had advised way back when NATO was expanding. Um, I don't think it's a very good solution. The whole Ukraine thing is, in a sense, it, it gets to the most problematic issue of the West and of, in a sense, liberal internationalism. If you've got a place like Ukraine or like Taiwan, which says we want our self-determination, the situations are different. Taiwan is legally somehow a part of China. Ukraine is not. It is a separate sovereign country. Uh, so the whole international legal context is different. Um, but do you, in fact, take risks to uphold the self-determination of outsiders? And, um, you know, that problem goes all the way back to day one, and we now have it in very acute form in Ukraine, and there's just no easy answer to it. Okay. Gee, you're cheerful. From, from Tom Remington, uh, how much does or will Western security in the future depend on the credibility of America's nuclear deterrent? I think it will, Tom, to some extent, um, and I'm not sure the credibility is a is a is a big word. Um, the United States will have the ability to blow up any part of the world. It does now, and it will for the foreseeable future. Credibility is, as you know, a question of when you credibly threaten to use nuclear weapons which has to go, which, which depends on the purpose and the situation. Um, I think the United States can reduce its nuclear forces by a significant amount and still have a credible deterrent that would in fact uh, uh, visit unacceptable destruction on just about anywhere and anyone else. Uh, the question is whether the United States could defend itself from other people's nuclear weapons and for a while we were working on missile defense that has some limited utility, but now we have the development of uh, the uh, hypersonic weapons, which don't follow a traceable ballistic trajectory. The Chinese have tested them. The Russians say they have them. We have them, I'm quite sure. Um, but those can't be defended against in any effective way. And so we're kind of back to uh, square one of mutual assured destruction. Um, question, where do you see us? Where do you see what we now think of as the West in 50 years? Well, I think, uh, you know, that as I, as I said, um, I think the United States is going to wander off into itself and the Pacific and I'm not sure where Europe is going to be going in 50 years, um, but probably uh, somewhere different from, uh, from where it is now. Um, and I, I really, you know, I come back to this. I don't, I don't, I see this as, as history, not as decision. Um, nothing lasts forever. And I would, would point out that, you know, we can talk about the United States, but it's also true that Europe does not share our libertarian ideology. Individual freedom is everything. Vast differences of wealth and power are celebrated, justified. The state is the enemy. That's not a European position at all. And yet I think it will prevail in the United States. And I think that, you know, over time, uh, the alliance will weaken. And the question is how fast? And in 50 years, I don't think it's going to exist. But by then, I think all of world politics is going to be a very different animal if we don't invent some kind of real global authority for the environment and another one for health problems and maybe some rules on migration 
and some other rules on financial transfers, actually US and Europe have started in on that one, um, the whole world is gonna be a huge mess. And so the question then is how can we invent a different form of the old internationalism, which is going to provide everybody because the world now really is global. It's not like that map I showed you of 1949 with the capability to do something about the environment, about health problems, about migration, about the breakdown of order in a whole lot of places affected by climate change and drought and ethnic conflicts and, and you know warlords and just general chaos. Check out Ethiopia this week for case study number one. Um, and this has got to be reinvented, but it's got to be reinvented on a global scale. And I personally don't have an easy formula for doing that, but it's going to have to happen. That's 50 years. Yeah. I'm going to try to turn this, and I think it probably will be our, our the last question. David, David Sauer wrote it as a comment. I'm going to try to turn it in a way into a question. If our... What? We can have the comment. <laughs> well, David, go, are you on? Go ahead and make the comment. <laughs> okay, I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. I said it appears that our internal and international problems grow out of our historic and contemporary isolation of our general population from the rest of the world. We are handicapped by our American-centric worldview. At the same time, we are not even honest about our own history. I mean, is that is that the root of our problem? There, there, there are a couple of parts to that. Are we not honest about our own history? I think that's true. I think we have been not honest. Um, what would be honest about our own history is something we can talk about at great length, but certainly not what I was taught in school. Um, it needs some serious additions to it, uh, having to do with obviously uh, racism and slavery and uh, indigenous peoples, although those are not to blot out everything I was taught in school, but that's another discussion. Americans not being aware of the rest of the world, I think is a different matter. I think just as much as elsewhere, Americans are ignorant of the rest of the world. I don't know of any place in the world that doesn't have its own centric view, fill in the preface to that, of what the world is like and what the world ought to be. I think we have a lot of contact with the rest of the world, and I don't think we're that isolated compared to most places. Um, just as a homely example, I just finished last week teaching my class at Orono. It was a class of 25, and in that 25 were, this is an undergraduate class, a Russian, a Canadian, a German, and somebody who's, uh, who, who's ancestor, well, and, and an Iraqi, Iraqi-American. That's not isolation from the rest of the world. Um, these folks actually were leaders in the class, uh, including the Russian and the Iraqi American. Um, I think this is true throughout the country. I don't think we're that isolated, but being not isolated doesn't necessarily make you more accommodating or favorable or understanding in the usual sense of that word. word. I think we've got lots of contact. The question is how we interpret it. Okay. Thank you. One more, <laughs> may we? Yeah, yeah, sure, go ahead. Okay. What might happen or what might anyone in this world do that would change the picture you're presenting? Well, obviously I think we all have to work on thinking about and putting into effect as best we can think about it, this new set of international institutions, agreements, and values that I was talking about. Um, 
rather than trying to, to, to answer that question directly, because I don't really have a direct answer. I mean, we all know what we can do individually. I, th I think there's a paradox. We don't want to solve our problems by following the next great leader, because that probably will make them worse, uh, depending on who that leader is. What we really need is something very much like, and I will tread on uh, eggshells here, something much more like a new world religion or ideology that puts the environment and puts the human rights of all human beings at the center of consciousness. And I think that's a kind of a religious conversion. It's an ideology. It's something that has roots now, but it's got to spread and spread and spread and spread to the point where political leaders, all of them wedded to old outmoded structures of power and ways of doing business are going to have to pay attention. And I think that's happening, but I don't think it's happening fast enough. Do we end there? <laughs> That's an optimistic note. Oh, well, we'll take it. Seth, thank you very, very much. And I'm sure I speak for, for everyone. This has been an extraordinary evening and we're grateful and we hope we can share the optimism. So thank you. Thank you all. Get on to it.